Nice to see you. And hi. And uh, I'm continuing today where Ayananda Bodhi left off last time. And uh, I think, you know, just for those who have never met me before, and I think there's almost nobody, I don't know for the people who have, who are on phone, which I can't see. You know, my name is Aya Santa Chita and I'm born in Austria. So I speak with a, with an accent and I hope you can understand me. And uh, I'm a nun since uh, almost 30 years now. And, and I live out here in a local Vihara, which is about an hour away from Sacramento and the Sierra foothills together with the five other nuns and we're going to have an Anagari coordination coming up next month. And, you know, our life on some level hasn't changed very much since the whole COVID, you know, erupted into our world. The only thing that changed is I had to learn a lot of uh, about online teaching, I had to kind of uh, quickly brush up on that. So otherwise, not so much has changed and today it's raining outside. We have a lot of rain going on the whole day. So that's really wonderful. And I think, you know, what I wanted to speak about today is the second uh, quality of the, of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is Sama Sankapa, and it can be translated into right thought, right intention, or, you know, right, uh, right orientation. And maybe we start, you know, with the refugees and precepts first, because the refugees and precepts are really like the foundation of right intention. You know, to have a, like a certain kind of framework within which we try to kind of keep our practice. And Kathy, can you please screen share them in? You know, and whoever of you is ready to take the refugees and precepts, Kathy is gonna mute everyone except me and then you can just follow along. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna chant Namotasa three times and then afterwards all of you can chant it three times as well. <coughs> Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa so now I'll give you some time. And now I'm going to do the start with the first line of the refugees. So I'm going to say one line and then I give a little space for you to, to repeat it. And then I say the second line and we're going to go through all nine lines in this way. Uttang saranangachami Tamang saranangachami Sankang Sarananga Chami Tutiampi Putang Sarananga Chami Tutiampi Tamang Sarananga Chami Tutiampi Sankang Sarananga Chami Tatiampi Putang Sarananga Chami 
Tatiyam pitam mang saranangachami. Tatiyam pisangkang saranangachami. And now I'm going to say each precept in English and then give you some space to repeat after me. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. So now I'm ending with a short blessing. Imani pancha sikha patani, silena sukatinyan te, silena poka sampata, silena niputinyan te tasma silang visotaye. Okay, and now Kati, maybe you can uh, bring in the Noble Eightfold Path mantra. And now we're going to chant the Pali words in a, in a row down the page and we repeat the whole cycle nine times. So I'm just going to you know, go around nine times and then you can just join in whenever you feel you got the hang of it. <coughs> <coughs> Ti sama sankapa sama vacha sama kamanta sama achiva sama vayama sama sati sama samadhi sama titi sama sankapa sama vacha sama kamanta Sama Ajiva, Sama Vayama, Sama Sati, Sama Samadhi, Sama Diti, Sama Sankapa, Sama Vacha, Sama Kamanta, Sama Ajiva, Sama Vayama, Sama sati sama samadhi. Sama titi sama sankapa. Sama vacha sama kamanta. Sama achiva sama vayama. Sama sati sama samadhi. Sama titi sama sankapa sama vacha sama kamanta sama achiva sama vayama sama sati sama samadhi sama titi sama sankapa sama vacha Sama kamanta, sama ajiva, sama vayama, sama sati, sama samadhi, sama titi, sama sankapa, sama vacha, sama kamanta, sama ajiva, 
Sammavayama Sammasati Sammasamadhi Sammatiti Sammasankapa Sammavacha Sammakamanta Sammashiva Sammavayama Sammasati Sammasamadhi Sammatiti Sammasangapa Sammavacha Sammakamanta Sammashiva Sammavayama Sammasati Sammasamadhi So, and now we have time for a, a sit. So please find a posture you can sustain for about 40 minutes or so. And just you know, in the beginning, just want to mention there's two ways, you know, we can go about meditation. Either, you know, we want to achieve something or letting go of something. And the letting go of something is a much better approach. Basically, a letting go of ignorance and just, you know, bringing the mind back to the present moment experience and just every time you remember it, you know, stepping out of the thinking process and coming back to just the posture, the body breathing in and breathing out. And I think because today we're going to speak about the right intention, just remembering, you know, why actually why are you coming to this uh, teaching and why are you meditating? So just bring that to mind, remembering. And also paying attention to the postures, the having a straight back, a relaxed jaw. And also you know, bringing to mind how different it is that we are sitting this day and age of COVID. A lot has changed since we saw each other last in person, which was at the end of last year. And now, you know, the practice has a much bigger place in our life because we are really confronted with how little control we have about what's going on outside of ourselves. And in a time like this, you know, that uh, capacity for cultivating the mind has much bigger place in our lives because we can see that's the only thing where we really can make a difference right now and then from that you know mind which we are cultivating stepping out into the world and acting and speaking
And whenever the mind wanders off into thinking about something, if it's like a short wandering, just you know, bring it back, bring the mind back to the experience of body breathing. And if it's a longer one, then just you know, connecting with the feeling tone of that thought formation, which can be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And you know, and going after a pleasant feeling is greed or desire, lust. Hooking onto an unpleasant one has something to do with not wanting, aversion. And neither pleasant nor unpleasant neutral is same with you know going off in delusion. So to just see, you know, what what is it that you know makes us drift off present moment experience into thinking. And just for a moment, you know, paying attention and then just coming back. And then once, you know, the mind settles and the body settles a little bit, we can actually appreciate that a mind which is not hooked into any thought patterns is inherently peaceful and pre much more satisfying to be not hooked into the thinking mind when it's not necessary. So if the sinking mind is in abeyance, it is a sense of a wholesome joy, a subtle sense of joy. And we, the mind needs to be trained in order to be able to appreciate that because it's quite a subtle sense of joy, like an acquired taste, which we need to refine the mind so it can really appreciate it.
So whenever the mind wanders off into thinking, if it's just a short distraction, bring it back. And if it's a longer distraction, just going underneath and seeing you know, what's the feeling tone and what's the mood of the mind. And seeing that and then just, you know, dropping that, seeing is it desire, is it ill will, is it just aimless wandering and dropping it and coming back. So it's that letting go, the practice of stepping out and, you know, being with the tension of not being able to go down one's preferred way of you know entertaining oneself and just coming back to the simplicity of the present moment and being with the with the sense of uh, uncertainty which that brings you know if we can't do what we are used to do sense of frustration maybe. And also you know, paying attention to the sense of relief, you know, when the mind is temporarily free from the kilesa. So we know they have just gone into abeyance for some time and for now it's like the clear surface of the lake. There's no nothing stirred up right now or the cloudless sky. Clouds will come again but for now there's this openness.
And then as a next step, you know, we can uh, uh, bring up an image in the mind, um, you know, which evokes in you a sense of either meta or uh, so loving kindness, benevolence or compassion. Bring up an image. And then just the feeling in the heart center, you know, that uh, energy. And then the breathing in, being aware of how that feels and breathing out and spreading it out. Not forcing it in any way, but just gently allowing it to expand. And with the thought like if it's meta, may all beings be happy and if it's compassion, may all beings be free from harm and the intention to harm. So with the in-breath, you know, we feel how it feels. And then with the out-breath, we just gently allow it to expand out into space. And just being aware of how from the heart center, the, the quality of metta or karuna, how that uh, radiates out. So first it suffuses in our own body, our own being, pervades ourselves and from there it goes out into the universe. In whatever way it wants to radiate, no forcing.
the temporary liberation of the mind through metta or karuna. And at the same time, it's a way to familiarize ourselves with that particular feeling quality of that uh, Brahma Vihara, how that feels in the body and in the mind. <coughs> the more you know, we familiarize ourselves with it, the easier we can uh, call it up in life if we need to. And if the mind wanders off thinking about something, which is just a small distraction, bring it back. And if it's a longer distraction, we, again, checking out, you know, what's the underlying feeling tone which distracted you? What's the mood of the mind? And then just bringing up again the image, you know, to evoke the Brahma Vihara and then, you know, allowing that feeling to permeate your being and radiating out and with the in-breath familiarizing yourself with the quality of the Brahma Vihara and with the out-breath just allowing it to spread out. So we can you know now be with this for some time.
So if the mind wanders off, just checking the feeling tone, which is produced by that wandering and the mood of the mind connected with it. Pleasant feeling, it's desire or lust or wanting and unpleasant is aversion, ill will, hatred and aimless meandering is a delusion, confusion. And then with the in-breath, you know, familiarizing ourselves with the feeling quality of the Brahma Vihara and with the out-breath, just gently allowing it to expand. Then we can do the next step, which is, uh, you know, allowing the Brahma Vihara, the Metta or the Karuna, kind of transform into equanimity. Sometimes you know, equanimity is, is explained like the love of a grandmother who has seen everything under the sun, you know, because she has lived a long time. And she knows, you know, things are coming and going, arising and ceasing. And uh, in that way, you know, paying attention to the breath and seeing the impermanence. This this flux flow of the breath and sinking mind and the body. And our lives as individuals and also our lives as a society and as a, as a species and how right now, you know, we are undergoing a huge shift. We are in the middle of a shift. And if we see everything what's happening in the sense of the impermanence that gives us the, that oils the wheels really to be more able to open to this. So allowing impermanence to inform ourselves and allowing to wash away that automatic response of clinging, of wanting to have things a particular way. And sometimes, you know, we, we can do that and sometimes we can't. And with COVID in particular, you know, we can see how we have to open ourselves to what is happening and to the teaching in that. Because every, every other way is, is not working.
So allowing you know, the truth of impermanence to wash away the clinging. And then through, you know, washing away the clinging, we can more clearly see that, you know, things do, do end. Everything ends. A breath, a thought, a way of doing things, a worldview, a paradigm. everything is really and truly impermanent and in times like this you know it's really uh, coming home to us that is really true not just for little things this is the way things are this is you know for what we have been practicing for to be able to stay open to what's happening big and small Now we are standing on a threshold where our way of our practices, how we have been organizing our lives. They are having to, we have to investigate and reconsider all of this. And the, the virus is like a heavenly messenger, you know, shaking us up and showing where we need to put our attention. You know, that way of how we have been living under the ignorance of we are separate entities in a on planet Earth, where we can try to manipulate things in, for our benefit. It's not happening anymore. That illusion has been showed up very big now with that virus. Most likely, you know, to really protect us from going in the wrong direction for longer. We need we need it to be stopped in some way, and now it has happened. And the minds, you know, our minds are struggling against it, which is understandable and to be expected, but then we can use the practice to learn from that. You know, to familiarize the mind with the truth of impermanence and you know, stealing the mind enough so that it can pay attention to it you know, impermanence on so many levels. Big and small. You know, and then we can also relate it to the, to the breath. This could be my last breath. You know, thinking that thought with the in breath and then with the out breath, just letting go. You 
and so familiarizing ourselves with the impermanence of everything even in our lives this could be our last breath and that we we don't want to squander this opportunity we really want to you know do our best for ourselves and for all sentient beings Which means, you know, really looking in the mind and seeing those uh, three root defilements. Desire, ill will and delusion, ignorance. And doing the best we can, you know, for our own benefit and for the benefit of others. At a time, you know, where we are really at the, we have hit the wall basically, and now waking up is really the only way forward. When movement, you know, in the material world is no longer possible in the same way as it was, we can still move inside the mind. We can develop the mind. The most important development. Because even, you know, if we, if the body dies, whatever has been developed in the mind can come along. So it's, it's a, the best investment really to make. So, so letting go of those through three root poisons is the best possible usage of a lifetime. And then, you know, living from that freedom and benefiting others. So, you know, that's the whole, basically, you know, template for the practice first, you know, stilling the mind enough so we can see what's going on in the mind. And then when the mind is temporarily quiet, you know, cultivate uh, the Brahma Viharas. And then you know, the fourth of the Brahma Viharas is equanimity. And then with equanimity, look at impermanence. Impermanence on many levels. And the most powerful one is looking at our own death, the possibility of this could be my last breath. And then from that recognition that this could be my last breath, having a sense of urgency, you know, to really use this life for the benefit of ourselves and for the benefit of all sentient beings. <coughs> and, you know, that benefit would be to really work on letting go of those three root defilements or the root poisons. You know, clearing the mind so that we are more capable of living a life which is beneficial for ourselves and for others. So I'm just gonna ring the bell.
you know, Kathy, you also need to look at the people in the waiting room. A few, I have clicked a few have come in, or maybe can you open the waiting room? So there, it should be empty now. I let a couple of people in during you the also, sit. Yes. Okay. So welcome new folks. Uh-huh. Hello. So I wanted to speak a little bit today about what Sama Sankapa is in Pali. That's, you know, the second leg of the Noble Eightfold Path can be translated as right thought or right intention, right resolve, right uh, orientation on the path. And I've called it, you know, like the GPS on the path. Because in times like current times, you know, where there's a lot of new things have, have arrived in our lives and it's kind of unclear, you know, how to navigate the complexity of what's happening and what needs to happen. It's really not possible to think one's way through it because there's so much uncertainty. But what we can do is we can you know, point our energy in the right direction and then, you know, just allow life to take us along because it does it anyway, you know. And I, I just, in some way, you know, it is really scary what's happening right now, but in another way, it's also quite awesome, you know, that nature is actually directing um, the unfolding very much and 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 this this uh, covid virus how i see it is is just a way you know how we might have been saved from ourselves in a certain way you know to making things even worse so i have a sense of awe in the midst of it and then at the same time also a sense of you know great uh, uncertainty not knowing so many things and, you know, in a way, this always has been like this. We were just not aware of it, you know, because causes and conditions were such that we could kind of believe that we are in control. And now it has been really shown up to us. And uh, so this, you know, this concept of right intention as a GPS on the path, I find that very... Um, um, you know, helpful and reassuring that even, you know, there's a lot of chaos, but if we at least point our lives <coughs> in the right directions, then that's probably as good as it gets, you know, if there's a lot of unpredictable things going on around us, we can still work with that right intention. And right intention consists of three different parts, you know, the the first one is is uh, thought free from desire, you know, trying to kind of cultivate our minds into letting go of preconceived ideas how things need to be. And, you know, it can also be called uh, renunciation, which is not a very, has, it's not a very sexy word, I suppose. And it's more like a monastic word. And then sometimes it's also, we can also call it generosity or, you know, making a difference between wants and needs. So that would be the, the first part. And I think that one is very important because, you know, the whole um, question of climate change, as you all know, is really be very big looming in our lives. and the way, you know, how we live and what we take out of the planet is, is completely unsustainable. So, you know, to learn about renunciation and of, you know, being able to live with less is really very important for us. And then the second one is thought free from ill will or non in will or sometimes we can also call it loving kindness or metta benevolence that's the practice you know how we can train ourselves and then third one sought free from harm and cruelty and harmlessness or, or compassion 
So the three practices, you know, generosity, the antidotes, we can say, you know, how we can meet those thoughts in ourselves. Generosity, metta or loving kindness, benevolence, and karuna or compassion, those three practices. And before, you know, in the guided meditation, I have been bringing those up, you know. So the first part was looking, you know, what is dragging us into thoughts of last ill will and uh, harm and cruelty. It's, it's, you know, being attached to certain feeling tones. And, and with the practice, you know, we want to learn to notice, you know, how those feeling tones can drag us into certain ways of thinking, you know, and then those certain ways of thinking become habitual tendencies. And then it's, it's not easy, you know, for ourselves to stay conscious because we have developed that preference, you know, and whenever there is something coming up, we just tend to go down the same alley again and again because we are familiar with it. And then, you know, sometimes really big things happen which prevent us to do that. For example, now with the, with the virus, you know, where suddenly we had to change our lives in, in quite unexpected ways and there was no negotiating, you know. It just needed to be done. And we actually have done it and we are doing it. And we found ways, you know, to do it and we can still meet. Even it's different than it was before. But it is actually possible, you know, there's a lot of creativity and potential there if we are willing to turn around and activate it, you know. But very often we just try to, to not do this because we just think it doesn't work and we can't do it and because it feels kind of a bit uncertain and unpleasant and and I think, you know, what we are just in the middle of is, is actually a big showing up you know that actually we, we could do much more than what we are doing now you know and we have the the capacity really but we just need to take things serious enough so that we can really have that sense of urgency or in the scriptures is sometimes you know said like you know the the turban on the head or the hair on the head is on fire and but somehow, you know, we always find ways to kind of distract ourselves. And now we are in a situation where we actually have been able to make some quite big changes in a very short time. And just at the beginning, you know, the day of the session, I've spoken about it with Katya a little bit. And she was also saying, you know, how amazing, you know, we have been able to get a, you know, working, trying, you know, to get the curve of the, people who are needing, you know, like emergency treatment in hospitals to try to flatten that curve. And we have actually, you know, in different countries, it was successful in different degrees, but we have been able, you know, to work together for some, for a goal, you know, we have never before had to concern ourselves with. So, and that shows, you know, that we actually are able to do these things. And I think that should give us a, a sense of uh, hope, you know, and, and a sense of, of confidence that we actually have what it takes if we really take things serious enough, you know. And I think, you know, in order to be, have the, a mind which is able, you know, to sensitive enough to really take in what's happening, we need the practice for that, you know, because the practice is all about, you know, stripping away those layers of insensitivity and those layers of uh, distraction and then being really able to, to take in what's, what's happening and to really take in impermanence in a deep way, you know. And... So, you know, having a, having a practice and, and taking it serious enough that you're showing up here on Zoom and that you really feel a need to meet together as a, as a Sangha, that's a very good way of using one's time, really. And, and preparing the mind, you know, to, 
to pay attention to the truth of impermanence. And you know that just right now we are really on, on a very pivotal point in in the evolution of our species, you know, where we are suddenly realizing we really need to work together seriously about if we wanna, you know, keep on uh, evolving. We have to work together and we have to really take advantage of, of what we can do with our minds, that we do have teachings and the Buddhist teaching is a really very pragmatic one and we can really use it, we can. And this is really the best way what, what we can do with a lifetime is to use this human birth as a way you know, of cultivating our minds. So whenever we lose that body, which is gonna happen either you know, in a few minutes or in a few years or in a few, or in 30 years or whenever. So, you know, that when the time comes that we can say to ourselves, we have been really using this lifetime to <coughs> work on our minds. You know, and as I said earlier, the three practices, you know, in, in the context of right thought are generosity or renunciation, loving kindness or benevolence, and, and karuna or compassion. And, you know, they are not kind of very difficult to understand intellectually or like foreign concepts. You have all heard of it. And, and, you know, and those three qualities, they are not only benefiting the one who is practicing, but benefiting everyone around us. And, you know, to find ways how we can bring that really in our daily lives. And when, when a thought comes up, when, when we feel we want to do something to ask ourselves those questions, you know, is this, a, is this generous? You know, is this, where is, is it, or is it motivated by wanting it my way? Or is this, you know, is this really, is there a benevolence in this? Or is it rather like a way of wanting to push things away? Or, you know, is this compassionate? Or, is there a sense of, you know, wanting to hurt because we ourselves feel so, so much pain. And there's this delusion that if we, you know, kind of put the pain onto somebody else, then maybe for a moment we feel better for a second or, or two. And then afterwards, there's a lot of remorse. You know, can I <coughs> really stop here and just go in and feel the feeling and not act out? I think that's what what that uh, concept of right thought or right intention, Sama Sankaba is all about. You know, stopping for a moment and just reflecting. And then very often, you know, we will we'll say, oh no, it's actually much better to feel this unpleasant feeling than to act on it and then afterwards have remorse, you know, and then try to repair it and have to go through all kinds of trials and tribulations, you know, and win the trust back in relationship and and then at one point we just think oh it's much better not to act out in this way it's it's so much better to be able to stop and and just you know make ourselves bigger and so i think all of those qualities you know generosity loving kindness and compassion they're all about you know making ourselves like bigger making a bigger container to be able to hold the feeling tone for just a bit longer because it's impermanent and i, I really liked that there was a, a zen teacher her name was choco beck she always spoke about abc a bigger container you know the abc of practice a bigger container for everything you know for our feelings for our moods for our desires, for everything, to just allow that to be held in a bigger container and then 
just seeing, okay, you know, it's arising and then it's ceasing, you know, and that total faith in impermanence, we can, we can, you know, cultivate that through, through the meditation practice by, you know, stealing the mind enough so it can pay attention to ending of things, not only beginning, you know. And now we are in such a time where there's a lot of endings and we don't know yet what's going to begin because there's so much uncertainty. <coughs> but there's absolutely no doubt that there will be something beginning because it always goes on and on and on. And, you know, I really love the image of flowers. You know, they come out in the spring and then, you know, they're going to come out and be beautiful for some time and then they just go back in the earth and then there's not knowing what's going to be, there's darkness. And we are now in such a passage, you know, where there's a lot of darkness and it's very narrow and confined and it all feels like, wow, we have completely lost the plot. We haven't completely lost the plot. We have just lost the plot in terms of we have to reorganize ourselves. And now we have a time of... Uh, you know, going down and, and uh, you know, doing this a, shaman, a shamanic journey, really, you know, where everything is, is dark and we don't know what's going to happen next. And I think, you know, that is actually a very, it's an inevitable, you know, it has never been different, you know, that's how we learn. We learn by really fully understanding that the old ways are no longer working. That's how we learn. And I think and if we want to accelerate, you know, that, then we just need to really turn towards what's happening and really not distract ourselves. So, I mean, you know, sometimes we just need a break also, that's clear. But to kind of, you know, be, be generous, be courageous. And, and just opening and taking it on, you know. And especially people like us, you know, who do have a practice, who do know how to do it. We especially have a, a responsibility to really use the practice now. And, you know, we don't need to know, we just need to go at least in the right direction, you know, like when you're going somewhere I've never been before, you set the GPS, you know, and then you just keep driving as good as you can. And you don't know how it's going to be where you're going. But what else do you want to do? You know, you want to not do anything that doesn't work either. So that's, you know, that's what I wanted to share today. And uh, I'd, I'd like to read one quote. Uh, you know, from the Buddha, and it's about renunciation, and it might not be very sexy, as I said in the beginning, but I think it's it's actually very powerful because it really shows us up in a big way, and that's what we need to take advantage of. That that can be done. So it's about somebody who went to see Ananda, and then Ananda took that person to the Buddha. And they were speaking about um, renunciation. <coughs> so the Buddha replied, so it is, so it is. Even I myself, before my awakening, when I was still an unawakened bodhisattva, I thought renunciation is good, seclusion is good, but my heart didn't leap up at renunciation didn't grow confident, steadfast, or firm, seeing it as peace. The thought occurred to me, what is the cause, what is the reason why my heart doesn't leap up at renunciation, doesn't grow confident, steadfast, or firm, seeing it as peace? Then the thought occurred to me, I haven't seen the drawback of sensual pleasures. I haven't pursued that theme. I haven't understood the reward of renunciation. I haven't familiarized myself with it. 
that's why my heart doesn't leap up at renunciation, doesn't grow confident, steadfast or firm, seeing it as peace. That's a, a quote uh, from the Anguttara Nikaya. So, you know, saying that only through, fam if we familiarize ourselves with the drawbacks of being addicted to sensual pleasures and seeing, you know, the benefit of being free from that addiction. And that can only be really, you know, kind of cultivated through meditation. And I think, you know, that's the big leap we need to make. And, and we do have a practice, you know, we actually do, do have a technology to actually do it. We just need to really do it, you know. And uh, I was wondering, you know, we have like another 10 minutes or so. If anybody has a, a question or a comment, you could just mute yourself and speak up because we are not so many people so that we can try it that way. Please. I had a question come up in the practice we were just doing with noticing um, one thing, my mind is going to a lot of planning, like in the mm -hmm. last, in this period of time. And it seems like a comforting mechanism, like, oh, you've got to send that email. And it makes me not have to sit with like all the uncertainty that's there. Um, but I noticed when you were saying, well, when you get distracted or when you get pulled away, just notice the feeling tone. And there was something interesting that happened there where, um, I would notice the feeling tone and it would get much bigger. Like there'd be this little hint of like uh, constricted frustration. And then when I would notice it, it would be like, whoo, like take over my whole um, experience. And then it would kind of dissolve and I was able to go back to center. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to first thank you for that pointer. And then I guess the question I have is in, I had a moment of pause because I was thinking, oh, by noticing this frustration, am I cultivating the frustration? Am I actually investing in having more of that happen? No. Okay. No, you're, <laughs> no, you're not. I think it's more like, you know, you see more clearly what motivates you, you know, to, to kind of turn away. And I think if you really pay attention to it, it's, it's just going to, just show it's you know show you see what it is and and it, you will see that it's it's it has a middle uh, has a beginning a middle and an end I, I don't think you know if you would indulge in it that something else than being mindful of it you know and what I was speaking about was you know being mindful yeah I see there's a question Kate. I can't just read it huh Please comment on an intention versus a goal and how to avoid attachment to this. I think, an, you know, an intention and a goal is maybe quite similar in a way. You know, if, if our goal is, you know, to free the mind from greed, hatred and delusion would be the same as having that intention. And what makes any intention or any goal, you know, difficult is if we attach to it. But if we have it as a guiding star, you know, we have it as a guiding star, which we look up to, but then, you know, we have to also look on the ground where we are walking, otherwise we're going to stumble over all kinds of obstacles on the path. So, you know, it's not, the, the point is not, is it, a, is it an intention or is it a goal? But the point is, you know, are you attached to it or, or are you uh, using it as a guiding star, you know, as a, as a way to to kind of have a, a clarity in which direction you want to go. Because sometimes the going gets very tough and can be very confusing. And then we need to be clear, you know, because we might not be able to identify certain things for what they are, but we, we will be able to know, you know, it's, is this in the heart, is this coming from generosity or is it coming from, you know, holding on? Is this coming from benevolence or is it coming from ill will? Is this coming from compassion or is it coming from cruelty? 
You know, even we don't know more than this, but this is enough to, know, to go in the right direction. Yeah, Gwen? I had a, yeah, just kind of um, similar kind of, or similar topic, this, this distinction between intention and goal-oriented um, thinking. And I guess, you know, one of the things that I find happens with me in regards to intention is I get very into the specifics, like planning, like, oh, I'm going to sit every day for this number of minutes. And that really brings me into this other kind of, you know, future planning, not very mindful type of activity. And it really helped me that you talked about the GPS, like kind mm -hmm. of go of some of the specifics and more like setting this more general intention or goal and then letting go. Um, yes. That really, anyway, just wanted to say that that was really, really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you know, you. it makes also sense to me, like to have like a little, you know, to have like a bit of a template of your day, maybe where to have a sitting in the beginning and at the end of whatever you can do in your life. You know, because to have some clarity, but then if you over anything you we overdo, you know, too much planning, and then it's a trap again, you know, but no planning also doesn't work. So it's always about the middle way, you know. And then when you see you go off, you know, then just come back, what is it? You know, is it like maybe there's a certain fear or insecurity, and then you think if over planning, you know, can actually distract you from that uncertainty. Okay, oh, you know, do you see that? And then you just drop it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we are in a really amazing time now with all of this, isn't it? awesome in some way and awful at the same time you know yeah i think you know that's what evolution looks like you know Looks like we need a lot of support, isn't it? We need to be really kind of like, you know, I sometimes see it like when, when kids have to stay back in school because they haven't been paying attention or how that's called in English, you know, because they haven't been willing, you know, to pay attention and they have to just stay longer because, and it's like for us, like now we are forced by circumstances to, to really, you know, take a good look. And the more I think we cooperate with that, you know, the, the, the less painful it's gonna be for those who can really uh, go with the, what's needed, you know. Just, you know, do not resist it, do not, uh, yeah, because, you know, the pain, there's a lot of pain brought up in many different ways by maybe losing one's work, losing loved ones, losing, you know, the plans for the future and whatever people, you know, are confronted with. But then if we put the resistance on top of it, then we multiply the suffering just, you know. And, and the practice can help us with that, you know, to not multiply the suffering. The pain is the pain. That won't, you know, just disappear. But we can do something about the suffering. And that's better than being not able to do anything, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's all I, you know, that's all I can, I can share and, uh, you know, using the GPS of right intention in terms of generosity, loving kindness or benevolence and compassion, you know, for ourselves and for what's going on in our own hearts and what's happening around us, you know.
and if we would you know if we would really if evolution means you know to to kind of be more proficient in those qualities then if we see it in that way that evolution is about you know living in a bigger sense of uh, non-separation you know having more clarity about non-separation if that's what it is all about you know then what we are experiencing now in this time of the covid virus makes a lot of sense you know and because evolution doesn't really care so much about individual preferences you know <laughs> yeah There's much bigger game going on, you know, than that. And we are just like little grains of sand in this. You know, and even if we, I mean, even if we die, you know, if we're not fully enlightened, we're going to come back. So it's really nothing we can really lose, you know, which is of any value on the long run, you know. And I don't say that flippant because, of course, you know, in a conventional sense, there's a lot one can lose. But in an ultimate sense, there's nothing which is of true lasting value which can be lost because everything is impermanent. And that has never been as stuck, you know, kind of shown to us at the, right now you know where even a whole paradigm is now at its you know is starting to really fall apart you know and we all knew that something had to happen we just didn't know what to do and now just this thing happened and it, it does know what to do in in some ways you know it's not pain free but you know, we at least we have some medicine which is called you know, Buddhist teaching, which we can apply to this. Yeah. So maybe I should just end with a chant. Okay. Kathy, is that, or do you want to say something before, Kathy? I could say something quick before and then we can end on a chat. That sounds really nice. Okay, um, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll say now um, that the Dharma Collective is entirely community supported and run by all volunteers. Um, and so we're sustained entirely uh, due to the generosity of our community. And our community and us are not separate. There's just the community all together. Um, and so if you're in a place uh, of sufficient um, abundance to be able to give freely and joyfully to the collective, we would sincerely appreciate your donation. We are always open to everyone regardless of financial means. So if you're not in that place today, keep coming. Um, it's not a requirement. Um, it's a fluctuating, self-sustaining community. And I want to let you all know that for scaffolding for your practice now when we can't meet in a physical space one of the things we're doing is we have every single day a silent morning sit from 7 30 to 8 15 in the morning at this very same uh zoom link and so if you want some support for your practice to sit in community without necessarily a guidance or a teacher every morning 7 30 to 8 15 we're right here um, and then the last thing I will tell you is that our YouTube channel is a collection of really good resources um, as in this time where everything has moved online. Uh, one of the silver linings is we've been recording more. So we have a Wednesday night sit where Eve Ekman has been doing some amazing emotional practices, like emotional handshake practices. We've been doing Tong Len, um, Michael Taft and Michael Owens are doing a non-dual series that's part of a sutra study there's also a monthly death meditation so if you're interested in some of the stuff we were talking about today with impermanence and you want to spend an hour a month like really digging into that um, we have the archives on our youtube channel and you can join for that 
Um, so you can subscribe to that and you'll get a notification when this goes up uh, there also. And uh, Gina and Sylvia, I'll put the address in the chat box. And that is enough of me talking. <laughs> so uh, now uh, I'll just say, uh, Aya Satchitita, it's been just a joy to be with you today. I'm so glad um, we all got to share this time together. And let's chant. OK, thank you. <clears throat> May you have every good blessing. <clears throat> May all the tables protect you by the power of all the Buddhas. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Dhamma. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Sangha. May you ever be well. Thank you everybody for coming. And next month, uh, Venom Tamatipa is going to meet you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>